Hello and welcome to another frantically produced episode of Say by the 90s. My name is Adam Patterson. With me today, we've got someone who won 21 without cheating, Ken Bakley. Hey, Ken. Hello. Yes, I, uh, I'm, I'm glad we could bring up my uh, successful game show career from 1956. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's... A- it's an honor, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, of course, I won it legitimately. Many people oh. forgot about that show's existence, but no one has forgotten about your historic wins. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, I uh, came back to win again on the uh, spectacularly remembered uh, 2000 reboot hosted by Maury Povich. <laughs> well, there we go. This month on the show, we'll be taking a step behind the scenes and talking about four movies that focus on production be it in movies tv or in on the exhibition side of things so get that gaff tape prepped because this is saved by the 90s so what do you think 45 50 60 can't tell my teeth won't give me away if they are my real teeth i think i'd let you get this close if they were dentures maybe if i used effordent then there would be no stains or denture odor to worry about so what do you say not sure. We could ask my wife. Or is she my daughter? So effervescent. So effective. Your secret is safe with Effordent. First up, we have a coming-of-age comedy set against the backdrop of the Cuban Missile Crisis and featuring a William Castle-esque monster movie maker portrayed by John Goodman. Directed by Joe Dante and released on January 29th, 1993. This is Matinee. Monster movies. The end of civilization. Your first date. Some things will always be scary. Two thumbs up, say Siskel and Ebert. John Goodman. Matinee. Rated PG. Now playing. A small town film promoter releases a kitschy horror film during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Ken, we'll start things off with you. What were your initial impressions of Matinee? This movie is a delight. <laughs> I I agree. I'm I'm such a big Joe Dante fan. Mm-hmm. I, so I don't know if like I, his movies are just always my style. I just love not all of his movies, but most of his movies that I've seen. I don't think I've seen all of his movies specifically some of the really early ones, but I just, man, his movies are just my jam. This, this one not being an exception to that. I, I I love this movie. I saw this in the theater. Actually, my dad took my cousin and I to see it, which is really a weird memory. And I was trying to wrap my head around it because this movie came out in January, but I know for a fact that I saw it in the summertime. Mm. And I don't know, like, I, 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 I guess it was possible that it was still playing in theaters like six months later, but I really doubt it. And I'm trying to, I'm like racking my brain trying to figure out how I saw this movie. Like maybe it was at a, at a second run theater. That could be. Maybe it was an unseasonably warm day in January. No, no, because <laughs> see, see, my cousin would come to visit every summer. Mm-hmm. So he he would only be there in the summertime. And I remember like being on summer vacation and my dad taking us to go see Matinee. And I loved it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I mean, come on. This this is like a movie that very much speaks to me, like on a on a somewhat of a personal level, you know. Like I was a big mm-hmm. movie movie nerd back when I was a kid and I, I liked monster movies and stuff like that. And I had all the, the magazines, mm-hmm. lots of Fangoria magazines back then. And I just love the kind of the, just the vibe of this, the, the Americana, the classic theater vibe, the, the, the gimmicks that they used to, to use. I just, I love it. I love the backdrop. I love it all. It It's, it really is a movie that is so, wonderfully inquisitive i think it it isn't content to just kind of present these ideas just for their own sake it really does think about the not only the surrounding environment and the surrounding context but tries to look through uh every facet of what the setup implies and from there or perhaps uh as a consequence of what it's doing it feels like it kind of achieves that term that uh, sometimes people talk about which is kind of this 
universality almost through this extremely specific uh, framing. Mm-hmm. So it takes place in Key West, Florida, in a kind of a small town, and it John Goodman is this, like we said in the script, this kind of William Castle esque type of person where he's got this this new monster movie he's promoting called Mant, and he is testing out this new what was it called Atomarama or something like that. Uh... It was like a it was like a new gimmick that he was using mm-hmm. with this movie and if you rem- if i was going to say if you remember most of you probably weren't alive back then including myself but william castle like back then in the in the 50s and 60s movies all had kind of a, a gimmick you know there were they, they had to get people in seats so they would come up with these like goofy ideas like putting buzzers in the seats of the theater or doing 3d or having people dress up in costumes and run through the theater and do do all kinds of different stuff and and john goodman's character in this movie kind of does all of it Mm -hmm. and really goes nuts with the uh with the whole promotion thing and the thing that i like about goodman's character is when you first meet him, you think that he might be a bit of a slime ball. Like he seemed a little sleazy, mm-hmm. but I think, he, but he very quickly proves otherwise. Like there's, there's one point like when some of the kids are, are kind of in peril and the, the audience's safety is, is sort of in question at one point, And he, he seems to like genuinely care about people around him you know like his audience and stuff like that and he, and he turns out to be a pretty good guy mm-hmm. which i liked a lot yeah yeah i think it's called rumble rama rumble rama because that's the, the thing eventually the 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 gimmick thing the 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 the, the system that he has put in the yeah in the so theater. he puts like he puts like yeah. vibrators in their seats but then he also has like basically the whole theater shakes mm-hmm and the, the the whole thing here is that there's that constant fear of the Soviets bombing the the area, you know, dropping bombs on us. And, and because Key West is in such close proximity to Cuba, they had like frequent, you know, air raid uh, drills and stuff like that. And through a series of events people who are in the audience of this movie think that they're going to, that that the bombs are dropping and it causes a lot of, uh, a lot of chaos. Yeah. The very fraught, uh, 13 days when it seemed, uh, the probably got as close as, as the world's ever been to, uh, full scale nuclear war. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Oh, it it turns out that's also the phrase that's used on the Wikipedia article for the Cuban missile crisis, full scale nuclear war as you know, mm-hmm. opposed to the, the 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 one smaller scale nuclear war we've had, <laughs> I guess the, the 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 I guess it has to be full scale. Of, uh, another country is also firing off. Yeah, I guess maybe maybe if there's like retaliatory yeah. bombs being dropped, it'd be full scale. Yeah, especially when you have two superpowers like the U.S. and Russia. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it was bad yeah wasn't good yeah don't don't want don't want that uh yeah i mean i think goodman is really great in this as this character who you say it 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 feels like is occupying so many spaces at once it kind of feels like he is almost a stand-in for what the movie kind of wants to say about it's subject matter about kind of the, the, these movies and how they're be how people are perceiving them and how they're being, uh, and what purpose they're kind of serving through all this. So. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing about a lot of the movies, a lot of the monster movies or sci-fi movies that were coming out in the early sixties, they did deal with these very similar topics. I mean, the, so, so many of those movies dealt with, things like nuclear war and the, the the commies and all of that stuff. And this, this was certainly no exception. The, the, the whole Mant thing was, was a 
pretty heavy allegory. And, you know, Goodman, I think, yeah, he does a really great job in this role. And then you have Kathy Moriarty, who's never not good in anything mm-hmm. that she's in, who plays the, she's like the, his like star actress slash, uh, I don't, I don't think they're married, but I think they're no. together. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, it's an interesting kind of movie structurally because you have a lot of different things happening in this. There are, rather than just kind of focusing on one kid, it also kind of deviates and, and, and follows a few different kids. And while you do have sort of the main the main kid, Simon Fenton, uh, who plays Gene, you also follow around like Omri Katz, who was in a ton of stuff in the 90s, including my favorite show, Erie, Indiana. Mm-hmm. And so, it, I don't know, it's um, it's a little bit messy as far as how how it's structured and where the narrative takes us because it's not very focused no it's 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 and it's a movie that kind of feels maybe best as as this very broad community level or cultural level survey Mm -hmm. yeah i mean for me I, I like movies that just kind of meander and, and take and, and, and deviate from like the main plot and stuff like that. And I, I liked that this didn't just follow the one kid around as he was like forming a relationship with that, uh, the, the kind of weird girl or the girl that everybody thought was weird, uh, played by Lisa Jacob, Sandra, I believe her character's name was. I like that they we followed around the other kids, and then we also spent a lot of time with Lawrence Woolsey as he sort of set up the show and and promoted it, and like he would hire actors to like protest and stuff, which is something that you know that really happened too. Got a great soundtrack too. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, Jerry Goldsmith. And as far as movies that contain fictitious movies or TV shows, I would mm-hmm. like to see Mant. Yes, I also was thinking that. I'm a pretty big fan of Mant. I mm-hmm. we fortunately the cool thing is we do get to see a lot of yeah we we do get to see a lot of Mant. Mm-hmm. It's just a really cool movie. It didn't, if I remember correctly, it didn't do very well. No. It- it lost money. And I don't really get it. Is is it possible that there's just a degree to which it didn't have a hook for like a very broad mainstream audience? Yeah, maybe, perhaps. Maybe it had a kind of gimmicky filmmaking set against the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah, maybe. I do. I, I do notice the January release, which... Didn't seem not like a good time. Good confidence from Universal. <laughs> yeah, not not a good not a good time to be dropping movies. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's necessarily true anymore. Like, I, I'm wondering yeah. how how COVID uh, has changed that, or even mm-hmm. even pre COVID. I feel like the whole like January dumping ground was was slowly changing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are definitely spots on the calendar. I feel like no one has made any effort to try and like reclaim the last week of august in the american box office yeah we'll see how this that that might start to change this year as a fun fact one of the one of the friends one of the kids in this was played by Corey barlog who would go on to create the god of war video game series Hmm. and he i think wrote all of them the whole series including the the recent uh, like sort of reboot that came out in 2018, which was uh, very critically acclaimed. So that's just kind of an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. Started off as a child actor, moved on to make a highly successful video game series. 
Yeah. He seems like a cool, cool dude. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I definitely recommend checking out Matinee. I, I, I was wondering how you were going to feel about this because I, I was kind of thinking that, that I was biased in my opinions of this because I, I did have a pretty strong nostalgic tie to this movie as, I, as being like having fond memories of seeing this in the, in the theater with my dad. So I wasn't sure how you were going to feel about it. Yeah, no, I liked it. Uh, I saw, I actually saw it uh, a few years ago for the first time and really liked it then as well. I, I just think it's a, it's this fun, lively movie that feels very, I think reflective and uh, in inquisitive. I keep coming back, back to that word. There's just this kind of great, intelligent spirited curiosity to it uh that 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 kind of digs into the not only its subject matter but kind of what capturing the specific moment in history and thinking about it from uh different uh lenses i think i once read a piece on it somewhere i can't quite remember where uh commenting on it on like uh through the lens of like commentary on the military in films and i think the critic i think focuses a lot on like that final shot of the helicopters flying over at the end it feels like the the kind of the reading of it like being the the war machine just pumping on but yeah there's a lot of different ways you can look at this movie because it is it is just such that that broad investigative uh level to it yeah, it's interesting revisiting it as an adult because when you're a kid, you don't really take in any kind of the the historic value, like the the sort of societal impact that the Cuban Missile Crisis was having, and like just just the impact in general that it was having on everyone. You you don't really pick up on any of that stuff. You just kind of look at it as this fun monster movie type of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great. Check it out. Matinee. Mm -hmm. Next up, we'll be taking a look at a film that explores the scandal surrounding the popular 1950s TV show 21, released on October 7th, 1994, and, and directed by Robert Redford. This is Quiz Show. From Hollywood Pictures, critics are declaring Quiz Show the best American movie this year. USA Today gives it four stars. Siskel and Ebert give it two enthusiastic thumbs up. Gene Siskel calling it one of the year's very best movies. Everybody got the answers but you. Quiz Show will win a mantelpiece full of Oscar nominations. If someone offered you all this money, would you do it? It's a sure contender for best picture of the year. Quiz Show, rated PG-13. Now playing in select cities. Check newspaper for showtimes. A young lawyer, Richard Goodwin, investigates a potentially fixed game show. Charles Van Doren, a big-time show winner, is under Goodwin's investigation. That's that's great. That's great writing. <laughs> you always find them, don't we? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it, it's it, not untrue. It's artless, though. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it is a bit of a, a manila folder. Yes. I like this movie. Adam, what do you think? I agree. I thought it was great. I had a great yeah. time with this. Never saw this movie before. I remember when it came out because it was it was this and then the the movie that we're going to be talking about right after this they came out in very close proximity to each other and i remember as a kid always getting the two of them mixed up and i didn't really know at the time i didn't know that this was about a tv show and the other one is about a radio show but they still feel very similar to me like it's it's just one of those things where i will always it's like volcano and dante's peak mm -hmm. like or or uh armageddon and deep impact like i'll, I'll just sort of associate one with the other forever mm -hmm. and uh this one is quite good i i'm glad that i finally watched it i i don't remember why i never did i guess it wasn't a very interesting topic for a uh a, a 10 year old kid yeah, I don't, I don't but, think they really reached out to it through uh, 
kids media for promotion. <laughs> yeah, I, but I do remember my parents being really into this. And I just I remember this movie just being uh, just very popular in general. I mean, it was nominated for Best Picture and it looks like Best Actor in a Supporting Role, Best Director, Best Writing uh, for mm -hmm. Adapted Screenplay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, very popular movies, very successful. And uh, yeah, it's it's quite good. I I found myself very entertained by this. Mm -hmm. Didn't didn't really know the story about it at all. Like I did. I, I had no idea <laughs> what this was mm -hmm. about going yeah. into it. <laughs> Obviously, I knew it was about a TV quiz show, but mm -hmm. I didn't I like didn't know that it was about a scandal or anything like that. I didn't even know that it was based on a true story. So that mm -hmm. it was fun to look into the, the, the true story um, surrounding this. So yeah, I, I, I had a really good time with uh, quiz show. Yeah. This, this movie kind of climaxes at congressional hearings, investigating the scandal. And as you might expect for this kind of thing, the hackiest lines in the, in that scene where you're thinking this is just bad dialogue are taken verbatim from the record. <laughs> that, yeah yeah it was uh it's it's really fun i mean it was interesting to see how serious they took that back then mm -hmm. when maybe maybe this is not a good like comparison but i was gonna say where now like everything is fake on tv mm -hmm. you know everything is scripted mm -hmm. but back then like this was such a huge deal now i, I guess maybe if like jeopardy for instance if they yeah if, if it was revealed that that jeopardy contest ken jennings was <laughs> getting the answers beforehand or something yeah, yeah. I, I was gonna say everything else on television is extremely staged except i think anything that calls itself a, like a game show kind of competition in which case they are still bound by the post quiz show scandal legislation it's yeah it's kind of crazy mm -hmm. It, 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 this was just such a big deal, mm -hmm. but I mean, it, you know, it was a an extremely popular show, and to to learn that there was possible cheating, that, that mm -hmm. the whole thing was fake, you know, that that's a pretty big bombshell. Yeah, I, I think it's also a sign of just an era of like the television era as maybe one of uh uh where the american monoculture uh is very strong it, it it's one where there's a you know three channels it's one uh in which everyone is going to be receiving similar information through similar filters and receiving it about simultaneously it's crazy that yeah this is this was a show that had 50 million viewers yes like, can you imagine? Like, what? What did this? What was the viewership of the Super Bowl this year? Like, I, I don't. I think the Super Bowl has ratings are basically stable. Like, for some reason, they stay at about a hundred to about ninety five to one hundred and five million viewers, and it's like the only thing left in America that's viewership has not like entered terminal collapse in the last twenty years. I mean, it's just so wild to think yeah. that like every week. Yes, but yeah, 50 every week, million. 50 million people are going to watch uh, 21. It's just so <laughs> nuts. Yeah. But I mean, that, yeah, like that's what happens when you have no variety, when you have three channels and, you know, if the, the other two channels are something lame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, th 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 that's the thing is if you go back and like research into this, any show can get a good, by, by today's standards, and unfathomable rating just because of the lack of a broader set of competition. I think someone, I read, once heard someone very, um, very bluntly put it, you can just put complete, you could have just put complete garbage on, and often they did, and it would still get a number today that is simply unfathomable. I mean, I, it, I think like a lot of the stuff back then seems to me like it was just ad, like ads, like just really long yeah. ads. In this mm -hmm. case for, um, for, Geritol. Uh, for Geritol, which I actually looked up and it is still around. Geritol is is still a still a thing. That's that's it's a vitamin supplement. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, mm. yeah, it's uh, it's a company that's still in existence. I think they got bought by somebody, but the name is still around. It's retired blood. Yeah. It's per- what is tired per- blood? It perks up your tired blood. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're, what is tired blood? <laughs> if if your if your blood gets too riled up, that's called uh, hypertension. That's high blood pressure. Your blood needs to be a little tired. Yeah, I mean, you don't want it too excited. No, no, no I, I was I was thinking it, it, it's just a movie that wonderfully juggles uh, the different people peripheral to the scandal before settling on this quietly kind of wild Ray Fiennes performance. Uh, yeah. as Charles Van Doren, who is this kind of just, like, handsome, affluent from an English professor at Columbia that was supposed to come in and dethrone Herb Stemple as the, uh, as the reigning champion of 21. I, I do want to point out peripheral to that, that uh, the one acting nomination that this film got was for Paul Schofield for playing the uh, Ray Fiennes character's father, uh, Mark Van Doren, who was a noted... Uh, uh, academic in his own right. Yeah, I thought that Ray Fiennes was was fine in this. Like he 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 played that part very well. You know, I did. I think that Totoro as Herb Stemple was a, a more fun character. Yeah, and, and like a just a meteor character. Like just more going mm-hmm. on in this guy's life. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but. I, I do agree. I just thought that the, uh, the this the specific temper of Fines' performances is, is just kind of exists in this very strange category after a while, um, where it's a very kind of oddly, it's a very oddly relaxed interpretation of someone for whom the walls are closing in on them. He's making a lot of choices here that on a second watch, actually strike me as quite interesting, and I don't know if I'm ready to quantify them yet. Well, I, like, I'm wondering if part of it was, like, that he knew that he always kind of had a golden parachute. Like, he was already mm-hmm. kind of from an affluent family, and he, he won so much money already mm-hmm. by that point that, you know, I don't know. It, it, he's yeah. just an interesting character in and of himself, too, because mm-hmm. it's it's interesting that that he would want to go on a show like this. Like, yeah. Like it seems clear that like, uh, he, he's, although he's not like a failure by anyone's standards compared to his family pedigree, he is sort of the black sheep of the family. I would, I would say, and it seems like he wanted to kind of break out from the shadow of his father and and wanted to make a name for himself on his own. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's kind of interesting. What is inter- Another interesting fact is that the real Charles Van Doren and Herb Stemple died uh, a couple of years ago from the recording this almost exactly a year apart. <laughs> Charles Van Doren died on April 9th, 2019, and Herb Stemple died on April 7th, 2020, and uh, they were both uh, 93. When all, this, when all of this finally came out, Charles Van Doren was fired from NBC, so he quit, he quit the quiz show, mm-hmm. he'd lost on purpose, and then he got a, got a job as a... Well, he was on, was he on a panel show or he was like a an announcer or a host of something? But he got some he other was, show. Yeah, he was also going to be on tele. Uh, he was also on television. I think he was like on the Today Show, and I think he might. Oh yeah, so that's he, it. Yeah, he leaves the that Today too. Show. Like he, he like drops off from both of those. But I think they. I think NBC ended up letting him go, and then, and then he got fired from Columbia too. Yeah, and then... And then got a job at Encyclopedia Britannica. hmm So, like, he didn't really get canceled. I feel like... No, no. <laughs> I feel like the, the cancel culture back then mm-hmm. was uh, not quite as harsh as it, it would be today, perhaps. Mm-hmm. I mean, because while he did get fired from his 
from the jobs that he had, he did bounce back and he ended up like becoming a writer. And I think that he first started writing under a pseudonym and then at least that's what Wikipedia said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, you would get canceled pretty hard if you were in the entertainment industry and you were like in your name was like listed in red channels or something for a list of communist sympathizers there. Yeah. If you ended up on the blacklist. Yeah. Which is mentioned. I think that's no, no, no. That might be matinee. <laughs> that was mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was mentioned in matinee. Yeah. One of the uh, like people the in, actors in uh, this company were, was blacklisted. I enjoyed all the performances. I just had a had a really good time with this. I thought that it was a very intriguing, very exciting, like su like it's surprisingly thrilling at moments too, which is not something that I expected. Where it it gets there, there's some tension there with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it it is just this movie that's fun. It's it is entertaining to watch all the puzzle pieces kind of snap together. In kind of in the same vein, in the way that something like All the President's Men mm, is interesting mm -hmm. to follow in the same way. All the President's Men, uh, starring uh, Dustin Hoffman and Robert Redford, and Robert Redford directed this movie. Yeah, what a what a great job! I mean, Redford yeah. Redford's not known for being a director, but he's a damn good director. Yeah, and he got nominated for best director here, which I almost mm -hmm. feel is kind of hard to do historically with the director's branch. If you're like a big name, if you're like a, s a star who moves into directing, uh, at least in the last couple decades, there has been a resistance to it. Like Ben Affleck didn't get nominated for Argo or Bradley Cooper didn't get nominated for A Star Is Born. Although I will note that Redford also directed uh, Ordinary People and was nominated for that. So maybe they just, I don't know, maybe the, they carved out an exception for him. They cannot deny the the when Robert Redford makes a good movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel like a lot of his movies are very awards friendly too. Mm -hmm. Like they they definitely seem catered to to awards when you mm -hmm. look at his uh, his the films that he's directed over the years. Good stuff though. I I can definitely yeah. recommend Quiz Show. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Just yeah, great, great, just solid, meaty, investigative thriller, uh, almost like the qu energy of a very quiet thriller, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. And we should also point out Rob Morrow plays uh, Richard Goodwin, who was kind of the young, the young uh, attorney going uh, for the uh, uh, congressional committee that was going around and investigating this. He was good. Uh, his accent was a little off to me but it, it was very like conscious boston mm, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah but he's uh, making but still think, choices yeah i still think he did a pretty good job though <laughs> mm. yeah kind of uh varying so so in and out boston accent notwithstanding our third film this month was released a mere two weeks after Quiz Show, and while it's also a period piece taking place behind the scenes of a production, the tone is a drastic contrast, to say the least. Directed by Mel Smith and released on October 21st, 1994, this is Radioland Murders. On the biggest night of her life, Help! things are going from bad. How can you throw away everything we have? Had, Roger. Past tense. To deadly. Go back in time. Well, I told you it wasn't me. I think my head's gonna explode. And discover the lighter side oh. of murder. Oh. He never lied about killing anyone that I know of. Mary Stuart Masterson. Are you completely out of your mind? The Radioland Murders. Monday at 10, 9 Central. A series of mysterious crimes threatens the existence of a new radio network. Now... Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Wait, I <along> think... <laughs> uh, go ahead. Uh, I, I was going to say, I think we both want to spend as little time as we need to uh, talking about this movie. <laughs> the absolute yeah, how, amount of time. However, this is probably going to be the one we talk the most about, because that's always yes. how that... That's always how it plays out. Radio mm -hmm. Land Murders is a movie that I never saw before, like Quiz Show... Uh, I, I don't think so. I feel like I definitely would have remembered seeing this movie because 
oh my god what were they thinking <laughs> with this movie it is and this is like the type of movie where after i saw it i'm like how could anyone watch this movie and be like yeah that was great that was great <laughs> it, it because it is just it's so aggressively awful that mm-hmm. like i could i i hated my time yeah. with this movie like out of all the movies that we've watched on this show and a lot of them were horrible but you know they they've always had they were always like so bad it's good or you know just the, or at the, the very least pretty- you they kind of let you t- Tune it out and look past it. <laughs> yeah, they, there were redeeming qualities to most of them. And I really try to give a lot of these movies the benefit of the doubt. I when, I when I watch these movies, I'm not sort of trying to put a critical eye on them as much as I am like a, a movie, like a, a new movie that we review on the weekly podcast or anything like that. I'm just trying to be more casual with it more f- and just more laid back. But when I see Radio Land Murders, directed by Mel Smith, mm-hmm. I absolutely hated every moment that I spent with this movie. It is, it is just an onslaught to the senses in mm-hmm. every way imaginable. It is mm-hmm. aggressively unfunny, even though it's a comedy. You have a really great cast in here. I mean, you just you look at this cast and you're just like, wow, like incredible, like just a powerhouse cast. Uh, But they're all like just underutilized, unfunny. I I, I don't, I don't know what to say. Like it's, it's just nonstop. It's so intense. It is frustrating. It's exhausting. It's grating. I just couldn't stand it. I really could not stand this movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh it, it's the thing about this movie for me is that I completely agree with you. It is exhausting because it is just so much and none of it is funny, but it, it felt while I was watching it like I was somehow having like an out of body experience watching it because I could see a joke happening in front of me. I could see the mechanics of the joke happening. I could think I understand the mechanics of this thing that is a joke. I understand the point here for it to be funny. And I could even be like, sometimes I understand that this is funny, and yet it just runs through my brain and it does not come out as anything. It's it's just... The the humor seems to be a throwback to kind of classic uh like slapstick comedy like mm-hmm. screwball comedies maybe of of this era but n- it doesn't work and it ends up being real just goofy and dumb and i think that that part of it might at least for me like in 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 my opinions with it I think that that casting uh, Brian Benben as the lead, as as Roger Henderson, sort of a lead. I mean, it's more of an ensemble piece, but he seems to be like the main guy here. Um, He's like the head writer of this this radio station, which, by the way, like if you think about any logistics of this, like any kind of logic for for even a split second you shouldn't do everything. That. Everything falls apart. Like no, nothing that happens in this movie makes any sense at all. Mm-hmm. Like this, this radio station should fail. Like mm-hmm. it should fail. Not least <laughs> you, of which because everyone there is dying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like it doesn't deserve to thrive when you're launching a new radio station. And first of all, it seems like the program's, last about five minutes now i like i don't under i don't i i I wasn't around back during this time so maybe maybe radio programs did last five minutes but well it felt felt like they were they were jumping from show to show so fast Mm -hmm. well as a as of course a winner of the 1956 21 i should also talk about my uh winning streak on 1940s radio game shows oh yeah 
Yeah. Uh, so, so, it, uh, yeah. Since you're an authority yes, on it, they were all two minutes and five seconds long. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that that's like the pace. the The pace of this movie is it, it is just breakneck the entire time, and it, there is no reprieve. Like it's just rapid fire stuff happening all the time. Nothing's working. Nothing's funny. Uh, Brian Ben Ben is horrible. Like I just, I don't like anything he's in. His he's not like, given us a lot here to put it. Mildly. His I, I I find his voice to be very annoying. Like I just have problems. I hate to dream on too, which is probably like what he's best known for. Every time, like I never saw Dream On when it was on HBO because I was like I was too young. We didn't have HBO. Uh, it was a very adult show, but they would rerun it on Comedy Central years later. And every time I'd be watching Comedy Central and Dream On would come on, I would just hate everything. I just, oh, God, so awful. Mm -hmm. I I am weirdly now paralleling this discussion to another movie that I was thinking about uh, quite recently, because the week we're recording this, is the week when the trailer for <laughs> the the trailer for Baz Luhrmann's upcoming biopic about Elvis is coming out? And I was thinking about weird performances, uh, and particularly I was thinking about how Brian Ben Ben is giving us nothing, and from the endless trailer for Elvis. We had like Tom Hanks there as Colonel Tom Parker giving us too much, <laughs> and I'd rather see that. <laughs> I also think the dude that they got to play Elvis looks weird. Like he doesn't. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. There's just something about his look that kind of disturbs me. It just feels really off to me. Like he doesn't look like Elvis, but he also doesn't sound like Elvis or sing like <laughs> Elvis. So it's like why. Did you pick this dude? Because you he... think that you want one of those things. If you're if you're portraying someone who's very famous, very recognizable, and has a very distinct voice, that you would get somebody that fits one of those criteria. Uh -huh. And yet, I feel like the guy that they got does not fit. I know he's done a lot of, of like Disney Channel, Nickelodeon stuff, or he did when he was younger. And I don't really know what's he was. Oh, he was. Uh, he was in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I guess that's the only other thing I could who immediately who say. Him? Yes, I've seen that him in that. I mean, I saw that movie, but I don't know. Oh, he was name's... Tex Watson, one of the uh, murderers in the Manson family. Okay. Oh, he was in the Dead Don't Die. I mean, whatever. <laughs> yeah, just... I, I remember hearing uh, when he was cast as Elvis, and I was like. Okay, I, I I don't I I just thought they were kind of going with someone who didn't have an established kind of like type that they were playing as. So, but I mean, like I I don't have an alternative, and I, I don't care enough to like mm -hmm. think about it at all. So, whatever. Yeah, it's uh, it it looks it looks rough to me, and I probably won't see it. So, I am very interested in seeing this movie, and I also agree <laughs> the trailer makes it look kind of rough. Another great thing about it that's been pointed out, the like WGA arbitrated writing credit on this movie credits Baz Luhrmann three times as a writer, once for writing the story, and two times as a screenwriter. Which is absolutely hilarious. I love yes! that. Yes! <laughs> I love that. Uh, yeah, so getting back to Radio Land Murders. I yeah, I was not... just trying to give us something to talk about that wasn't Radio Land Murders for a minute. <laughs> I would not recommend it whatsoever. This was has a story credit by George Lucas. I'm not sure like how involved he was in this, but it is a Lucas films release and but Mel we... Smith, Mel Smith. You probably know him as the, the, the torture guy from princess bride, <laughs> the guy in the torture chamber. And then the director of the first Mr. Bean movie. Yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, he probably made more money directing than he uh, over the course of the rest of his life than he did for making Radio Land Murders. 
<laughs> Very likely, yeah. So the story behind this, I believe, is that George Lucas was supposed to make this in the seventies. Like this was supposed this was supposed to be like a round of the American graffiti, and it just got like stuck in in one of those things where it just gets stuck for like twenty years, and then then he became you know George Lucas, the creator of. Uh, then we came like you know George Lucas of Star Wars and Indiana Jones, and then he's like, "I'm gonna get this Radio Land Murders movie made," and then he did. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think that it's just it's just such a disappointment. This movie, like, I-, I I don't know, I can't. Like I said, I can't understand how anybody can watch this and just be really into it because I find it to be so annoying, so mm-hmm. annoying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it. it- that's the the weird thing is that I could see jokes that on an anatomical level I recognized could be funny, and yet they just were not funny. I just didn't understand what was happening. It, there was something about how this movie is simultaneously paced in a completely incomprehensibly fast way and an agonizingly miscalibrated way at the same time that does not give any of the jokes any room to breathe. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a it, it 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 it's just there is a very specific rhythm to doing fast-paced comedy and whatever that specific combination of traits is, this movie I don't know it and this movie but this movie doesn't know it either. It's it's almost like I would compare the tone of this like they it was almost as if they were trying to go for a clue vibe. Mm-hmm. But Clue does the the sort of chaos so much better. Like Mm -hmm. Clue is to this day, Clue is funny. Like Clue still works. But yeah, I watch Clue like once a year. I I love I love that movie. I think I think it is it's a classic. But this movie, it just it amps everything up. It's just it's too much. There's just too much going on, and you have this great cast, but they're they're just like they're all just doing their own thing, and like. I feel like there was maybe a couple things that I found to be slightly humorous. I think maybe Michael McKean did something that I found funny. I think I told you this a little while ago, uh, which is that I, like earlier today, I think I, uh, I, I did tell you that there is one thing in this movie that I remember laughing at, and I cannot remember what it was, and I watched this movie l- this morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh it, yeah i think your your point that everyone's kind of doing their own thing is maybe a big part of this there is no there is no opportunity for these actors to feel like they're kind of performing with each other rather than they're just existing parallel to each other yeah especially like some some of the characters like christopher lloyd who i, I liked his character as the sound guy but it also felt like his stuff was being shot completely separate from everyone mm-hmm. else. Almost like mm-hmm. <laughs> he was always by himself and his like, like sound, his little sound setup that he had there. And I don't know, man, this, this, this movie's just an absolute train wreck. I do want to point out this movie also stops briefly to uh, feature an appearance from uh, George Burns. Yeah. Which is uh, kind of bizarre. Who uh, would have been 97 during production uh has a cameo appearance we'll say i that's how it's described in the wikipedia article and i think that is what you have to call it and his i think gets like third place billing in the opening titles yeah i mean like he it seems like he plays himself which is weird yeah. to think of george burns in what what year was this supposed to take place? This is place in? in 1939, and he's supposed to be... The, the Wikipedia... Uh, yeah, it, the Wikipedia article credits him as Milt Lackey, a 100-year-old comedian. Uh, so George Burns... Uh, okay, okay. ...is playing a character who was born in 1839. George Burns was born in, like, 1890-something, right? Six. He was born in 1896. Uh, what a career. Yeah, this is his uh, final film credit, apparently. One of the interesting things, I guess maybe one good thing to take from this, is that this this movie got me looking into the career of, of George Burns. And, and yeah. his uh, very first on-screen performance is uh, on YouTube. 
you can check out some of his really early stuff from like the 20s on there, mm-hmm. which is just wild to think about that he he was in this short film from 19 like 20 something and then mm-hmm. goes all the way on to Radio Land Radio Murders. Land. <laughs> uh yeah. It's it's an interesting journey. Uh, 20, 24% on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm-hmm. Still feels high. I'd give it a 0%. It's, <laughs> I, I think there have been occasional efforts for people. There are people who like this movie, and but I, they're just, it, it's just kind of missing that kind of like broad groundswell of support to give it anything like a cult following, which I really don't mind. No, same. Same. It's just this was a nightmare. This was a complete fever dream of a movie that I and not in a good way. No, I just couldn't wait for it to be over. All right. Just before we go on, I, I, I will admit that I was, that I was just now doing that thing that I occasionally do when I have a complaint about a credit in a movie where I just pulled up the movie and was just silently watching the credits go by. And yes, my suspicion is correct. George Burns has extremely high placed billing in this. I think he's maybe fourth, not even any. End or like one of the special appearance credits. He's just straight up credited fourth, like he is in this movie for a lot of it. Yeah, I mean that that must have been some kind of like negotiation or something. Like, yeah, we'll give you George if you give him top five billing or something. Yeah. Not that he should have really cared at that point in his life. <laughs> no, 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 no. He, uh, <laughs> he, he kind of is almost the the opposite of you know Betty White dying right before she turned hundred. George Burns died very shortly after he turned hundred. He was he apparently had a uh like a lifetime contract with like one of the 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 Las Vegas uh casinos where he was supposed to perform then his 100th birthday but he just wasn't in good enough health by then so uh a Caesar's Palace apparently at least Caesar's Palace did not sue 100 year old George Burns for breach of contract for not being up <laughs> to performing on his 100th birthday <laughs> yeah uh, all right. Our final title this month jumps forward in time to the decade in which it was made, dramatizing the conflict between Jay Leno and Dave Letterman, who were both vying for the Tonight Show uh, hosting spot after Johnny Carson announced his retirement. Airing on HBO on February 24th, 1996, and directed by Betty Thomas, this is The Late Shift. A dramatization of the rivalry between David Letterman and Jay Leno over which one of them would succeed Johnny Carson as the host of The Tonight Show. So... Uh, I think you read yeah. it wrong. It was too over which. Too over which. Oh, excuse me. I My brain actually tried to make that legible. Cor- okay, yeah, let me you, try that you, again. You corrected it automatically. Yeah. No, I have to read that again. Excuse me. A dramatization of the rivalry between David Letterman and Jay Leno to over which of them would succeed Johnny Carson as the host of The Tonight Show. <laughs> <laughs> nice classic listeners well, i did accidentally read that correctly the first time and then i had to go back and read it as written yes i it needed to happen we always need to read the imdb synopsis verbatim yes is there no ad living allowed with that so this is the impetus for this month uh theme basically i watched this movie on hbo max Several weeks ago, and then soon, more recently, discovered that it aired in February 1996. And I was so taken by how quietly, or not even that quietly, just how regularly weird this movie is, that I had to pitch this to you as this has to be the centerpiece of February because I found out it aired in February of '96. Yeah, it it was. The thing is, this movie was a really big deal when it came out. Like it, it was an HBO movie. But everybody was talking about it. Like, it was mm-hmm. such a big deal when it dropped. And maybe it was because it, it took place only three years after the the events that, that it depicts. So the whole kind of, um, you know, ho- late night host rivalry was still very fresh in everyone's mind. And then they put out this, like, somewhat scandalous, it's supposed to be scandalous you know, movie that that depicts the whole you know feud or whatever you want to call it so maybe that's why it was like such a big deal but 
I don't think I saw this back then. I think maybe I did. Maybe I did see it because I think it might have been on Comedy Central, like way, way after it originally aired. But uh, I, I don't really remember too much. So I, I'm taking this as a first time watch. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I thought it was fine, actually. I, yeah. I thought it, it felt very, uh, very 90s HBO to me. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know what that I don't know if you can understand, like, what I mean by 90s HBO, but like, I, think it just, I might weirdly it just, <laughs> like I, I just feel like everything had kind of a similar look to mm-hmm. it where there was like lots of handheld camera shots and like everything felt very like kind of docufiction esque. Uh, I'm yeah. thinking of like um, the Larry Sanders show, it's like a theatrical film. Exactly, it, it it's like, like somewhere in, this, in the middle, in this liminal space. Which I don't know. I I can't tell you firsthand about HBO in the '90s. It's like a liminal space that you feel like maybe only pops into existence as the channel number you're surfing gets higher and higher. <laughs> yeah, I I like the look of it actually, and I feel like there are. Uh, some some directors that sort of kind of use this uh, similar style. Uh, it almost feels oh, like it. A, yeah, yeah. It almost feels like it was a Sorkin. I liked him. Um, yeah. <laughs> as far as the script, uh, mm-hmm. and then like, uh, who was the ah, I'm trying, who who was the director that did? Um, there's a director that does a lot of HBO movies that they're all, they're all kind of like political. Jay Roach. Jay Roach. Yes. That's who I'm thinking of. Like it, it, it has a very, like a kind of a Jay Roach vibe to me. Yeah. I, I believe Jay Roach did, I think, um, uh, bombshell a couple of years ago, which was a theatrical film. And I don't recall liking that at all. Uh, but yeah, it, it, uh, but it still kind of felt, the same way as his TV films do, which is that he did, uh, he does kind of like, yeah, recent films about recent events. Most and just kind of the, the, the aesthetic feels similar to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he, uh, he also directed the Austin Powers films. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wasn't thinking of those, but okay. I mean, those, those. <laughs> That's are good. no. This is actually a very interesting filmography. I'm looking at it now. <laughs> those, those, he those uh, are pretty good too. His, his films include the Austin Powers trilogy, Meet the Parents, Meet the Fockers, Dinner for Schmucks, uh, the Campaign, which was that one with like Will Ferrell and Zach Galifianakis, maybe. Um, yeah, and Trumbo about Dalton Trumbo, the uh, blacklisted screenwriter. Then for yeah, for TV he does like Recount and uh, which was about the 2000 Recount in Florida and Game Change, which is about uh, Sarah Palin as the, uh, mm-hmm. the as the 2008 Republican vice presidential candidate. Um, so that's an interesting career. Yeah, sometimes the movies aren't interesting. But the career is <laughs> good. Good career. It's all good. Yeah. yeah. So you know, if you're not familiar with what was happening during this time at NBC in, in the '90s and CBS too, really just all the late night channels were were vying for these 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 two people. And you know, Johnny Carson was getting ready to retire. It was going to be his last season, and both people. Both Leno and Letterman, they wanted they wanted the job. It was a, a dream job of of Letterman. It's what he always wanted to do, and uh, you know he got he got kind of screwed over by Leno. And you know history tends to repeat itself. So mm-hmm. if you all remember back uh, when back I don't know what was that like 10, 20, 15 year, 20 years yeah, ago two thousand nine twenty ten. No, oh I'm talking God. about when it happened, like Conan and stuff. That was yeah, yeah, yeah. That was 2009, 2010. I didn't mean to say 20 years ago. <laughs> Hasn't yeah, been quite was, that long, but I was it'll, say. Be, oh it'll be before we know it. <laughs> yeah, when uh, when you know Conan was when Leno was going to be stepping down, Conan was going to step into that, and then all of a sudden he pulled a 180 and was like, "Oh, actually, no, I'm not." But they had already, but Conan already left his show, so. 
what a mess that was. Yeah, uh, they gave, and, yeah. I don't I don't remember this happening when it happened because I think I'm still a little young. But just going back and reading about it, that entire time is just crazy <laughs> because I think they give like they give Jay Leno a 10 p.m. nightly. Yeah, talk show like prime yep. time, and the ratings are so bad. Like the net, the affiliates are revolting against NBC, saying, "Get Jay Leno out of 10 p.m. It is killing our numbers going into the news." Yep, and then as the way to fix that was that they put him back, they put him back in the Tonight Show spot, and Conan didn't have anywhere to go because Fallon was already in his spot, and then so Conan left, and he but he was like under contract or something. So he couldn't do like anything on TV. So he, yeah, he took it, took his show on the road and he did like a tour. Mm -hmm. And then of course they gave the tonight show spot to Fallon, which was, yeah. You know, it, it what, just, what can you say about that? It, it's just so, but it's, it's also funny because when you watch this, it's like Letterman should have had that like Letterman, deserved that spot he should have had it. it like it wasn't for leno and i the nbc just loved him yeah i i think that one thing about thinking about conan entering late night when he does in the early 90s is that it's something that obviously was a gamble and something that they won't even try anymore with all the any of the network late night shows to give it to someone relatively unestablished yeah. Like, who are the recent... Like, who do you think are... Like, the two most recent additions to the uh, network late-night lineup are uh, Stephen Colbert and James Corden, who... The one thing that I guess binds them is that they are not... They were not unestablished names by the time they got their shows, whereby NBC takes this completely nutty swing on a successful writer for the simpsons who had never done television in a serious way before uh as yeah. in front of the camera yeah it's pretty wild and like mm -hmm. leno leno didn't have uh, maybe i'm wrong but he didn't have his own show at that point he no, was just yeah. doing mm -hmm. he was just on like he did guest spots on the tonight show and he mm -hmm. filled in for carson yeah but i, re I remember like um, like uh, like Joan Rivers had the hosting spot there for a while too. Yeah, and then she, I think, she got her own show. Yeah, she got her show on Fox for a while. Yeah, one of Fox's very difficult efforts to try and get a late night show. And I think, uh, yeah, I think NBC or at least Carson uh was very upset by that uh for whatever reason. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't know. I just know that it, that it was. But oh uh, uh, yeah, she. Yeah. Well, she was very upset because they didn't. They didn't give her the Tonight Show spot, mm -hmm. and she ended up like, like ba basically boycotting NBC. She never worked. She never wanted to work with them again. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and then, and then uh, she got her Fox show. Yeah, and Fox has never been able to do a late night show. I've heard different reasons for that. Um, which which is weird, which is weird because Arsenio was actually very. Arsenio was was a popular show for for yeah. quite a while, and if you watch, like that show was so far ahead of its time. If you mm -hmm. watch some of the like old interviews that he did with people, like he would have such interesting guests on there and stuff. Like, I, I just I feel like Arsenio was on mm -hmm. was just doing mm -hmm. things. Like so, his his show was so fresh and tried. It was like a risk taking uh, show. Like he he would do, he wouldn't play it safe. And I, I think that his his show was very underrated. Yeah, it, it's. I think yeah, I think that was syndicated. But for, yeah, for some reason, Fox has never been able to do a late night show. I know. I was uh, kind of looking through some of the reading from, like, particularly the kind of a long buildup through the 2000s that leads to, like, the Conan O'Brien, Jay Leno uh, conflict in 2009, uh, 2010. And I promise I'll get back to the late shift of the movie eventually. But it's interesting that, like, the I think, like, uh, it was several years coming just because of the way that these contracts were going out where there was this informal agreement that Conan was going to get. Um, uh the uh 
Tonight Show uh, by the end of that decade. But in the lead up to that, his like contract was coming up, and there were efforts to pull him away, uh, including Fox really wanted to get him. But one of the reasons, allegedly, is that the way that the Fox networks are set up, they uh, the affiliates get control of it after 10 p.m. because that's when they go to news. So they were worried they would have to like broker individual agreements with affiliates to show a late anything that goes on after then is apparently one of the reasons that Fox has never been able to do late night. Hmm. Interesting. Hey, yeah, the entire history of Fox as a network is just crazy, but yeah, it's kind <laughs> that's of a, that's a story for another time. Crazy in so many ways. Anyway, the late shift, I think, is an interesting kind of weird movie because it's in what I have a theory is a very weird place for a movie based on true events to be, which is like two to three years after everything and it happened. Yeah. <laughs> like you can make a movie for TV, like while something's happening as they often did in this time, or you can make it like closer to a decade afterwards or more, yeah. but the like, dust is settled. Two, three, four years is such a weird place. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. I mean, it feels... It does have that kind of pre, you know, pre-second golden age of TV, like, TV movie vibe to it, where mm -hmm. there is, like... Like, it's good, but there is a, a kind of a, a lack of quality there. Like... Like first of all, I'll say that that John Michael Higgins does a great job as Letterman. Yeah, I, th I think it's a it's, there, it's a pretty intense performance. There are times when he really sells it. There are times when he it feels like okay, I am watching John Michael Higgins. Um, Daniel Roebuck is as Leno feels way exaggerated. Like yeah, no, he's in a different movie. <laughs> He is just, he's a cartoon character. Like, it just seems so, it, it's so much. Like, you're not portraying this this human being. You're, like, doing a parody of them. It's mm -hmm. like, he's in, like, a sketch show doing doing an impersonation of Jay Leno. He is more exaggerated than Rich Little's voice impression of Johnny Carson is. Yeah, which, by the way, what, come on. Why, like... You couldn't get somebody, somebody else, somebody else to play Carson because that just that was that was like not that was a really bad, really I bad like, choice. I audibly gasped the first time they brought him on as Carson. I I, I couldn't because he doesn't really even sound like Carson. That that is like definitely someone doing an impersonation of yeah a a, a person. And on top of that, he doesn't look anything like Carson. He looks like, uh, I don't know, like uh, Frank Sinatra in his later mm -hmm. years. Yeah, I, I, I think to whatever degree, yeah, agree. Yeah, they were not getting him for the for the, for the physical resemblance. <laughs> but they didn't really get a very good voice resemblance either. Nah, nah. See, and, and I feel like that, that those those things are some of the things that date this movie. Because I feel like today you wouldn't have that that kind of casting i don't think that that would happen today you'd probably get somebody a lot more famous who doesn't look close to being like them but then that they, they would probably just cake on a ton of makeup and make them look like the person apparently uh rich little has said that the that he uh was that johnny carson was extremely angry about him portraying him that seems <laughs> to be a recurring theme johnny carson got angry about a lot of things didn't he i yeah he he i i, I don't know he didn't seem like maybe the easiest person to work with yeah but, he, but he, he i don't know I never met the man, uh, so I don't know. No, no. Uh, but I do want to say there is a, a fun story that I cannot prove, but it's circulated along the internet, which is the second best thing, of course, obviously. Uh, that there is apparently, you can go back and find an episode of Letterman Show from when this movie, from around when this movie aired, where they brought, where he brought in John Michael Higgins as a guest and bumps him. Like, he, like, basically put Higgins in the in like the green room just 
purposely ran out the rest of his show and then is like, oh, sorry, we're out of time today, and then never invited him back. Like, just purposely did it to mess with him. <laughs> yeah, so I guess we know how what David Letterman thought of John Michael Higgins' performance in The Late Shift. It was it was a pretty fun movie, though. I, I, I enjoyed it. I had a good time with it. I thought that Kathy Bates was great as uh, Helen Kushnick. Uh, you have a lot of other really great side characters in here. Bob Balaban, Ed Bagley Jr. Uh, a lot of a lot of good good oh, roles yeah. in here. Lots of great, lots of just great performances. Sometimes like turned up very very high on the dial. Yeah, I mean, fortunately, Daniel Roebuck's role as Leno is is not quite as prominent as Letterman's in this, so. It didn't bother me that much. It still bothered me, but he's gonna be uh he's gonna be in the new the Munsters hmm. re remake that um uh, that Rob Zombie's doing. Hmm. So I guess that's cool. Yeah. He's gonna be Grandpa Munster. Mm-hmm. Cool. Interesting. <laughs> we'll 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 drag you love on the soundtrack. Oh man, I I really hope so. You know, it'd be cool if like they did like some kind of cool like remix of Dragula and made it like mashed it up with the Monsters theme or something. <laughs> yeah, I I think I think we just like any chance we can get to mention Dragula. Dragula. <laughs> of course, you also have David Bris- Brisbane in here who, uh. Plays a somewhat minor role, but he, I think, at least for me, is best known as Mr. Ernst in the classic Nickelodeon TV show, Hey Dude, which we absolutely have to talk about at some point on this show is Nickelodeon in the 90s and just the the bangers that they were putting out. It is weird that we haven't talked about Nickelodeon more on the show. Well, it's it's hard because like they came out with that documentary, The Orange Years, which, you know, that pretty much covers the the history of it. I mean, I guess like I still definitely want to talk about stuff like Snick and uh I, do do we do we did Are You Afraid of the Dark, didn't we? Didn't we like yes, cover we did. Yeah, we did cover that. Maybe I'd like to cover some more of that and there's like there's some other more obscure shows. We did do that other, the teen one. Was that called? 13 or something like that? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that that was, was all coming back now. Oh, my God. That one. <laughs> Man. That one is just... And nobody remembers that either. That that was like no. a really obscure one. I think that was in... Yeah, that was in like the episode where we were talking about like teen films and, and TV. Yeah. Shows. I think that was also the episode where I... um somehow managed to devote 39 minutes of the show to talking about the rage carry too. Yes. Yeah. That was your, that's your a, moment, your rage. That's carry a classic moment. episode. Yeah. For me. So I think, you know, the late, the late shift is it's fine. I think that it does a, a decent job of chronicling an, an interesting moment in TV. I guess if you're into like, the late night shows it's kind of a cool little time capsule piece it again feels very 90s hbo i mean this this is like when they were just sort of constantly flexing that they can do whatever they want so there's like lots of f-bombs in this like mm-hmm. they're dropping f-bombs every other word it seems mostly from kathy bates's character yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely <laughs> and and sometimes He's having it a felt- good time in this too Sometimes it, yeah. Sometimes it felt like HBO was just kind of doing that to do it, just because they yeah. could. Yeah. Um. And uh, yeah, it, like fun performances. Like, uh, I, I had a pretty good time with this movie overall. So I would give it maybe maybe a very light recommend. I mean, going back to my claim about this being a weird time for him to make a movie, I now did realize that All the President's Men is also a movie. <laughs> Uh, that takes place very shortly after the events take place. Oh, yeah. I don't know why. The the energy for this seems, like, really strange in the same way that, like, Jay Roach's movie about the 2008 election coming out in, like, 20... 
12 or something also feels very strange. Yeah, I am fascinated by this movie. I'm also fascinated by the subject matter. I know the journalist Bill Carter has written books both about this and the later Tonight Show conflict uh, that I've really been meaning to to read. So I just think it's an inherently fascinating subject to me, just the ways that specifically television works. Uh, because I don't know, rightly or wrongly, I associate like this high sense of immediacy with television. Just anything about television where the concern is that uh, you're running out of time before something goes on air, just inherently, I think that's automatically going to be uh, a great scene. Well, I think that's going to do it for this month. Thank you so much for tuning in. You can send us your topic suggestions to 90s at filmpulse.net or by sending us a message on Twitter or Facebook at 90s pod. And if you could consider giving us a review on iTunes, that would be fantastic. Until next month, for Ken Bakley, my name's Adam Patterson, and this has been Saved by the 90s. Bye, everyone.